Uh, perfect. All right. Ready to roll? Was that a yes? Yes, sorry. And what's your name? Chris. Chris, all right. I'm so used to work with Dan on this, so that's great. No worries. All right, Chris. All right, so um, what we're going to do over the next uh, 45 minutes or so is we're going to complete the lecture on pediatric head and neck. And what I decided to do in this talk was to go over the, a simplified approach to craniofacial vascular lesions. And I don't know about you all, but this is always perplexes radiologists. And from what I understand, it perplexes pathologists. And I think it can also perplex some of the head and neck uh, folks too, especially if you occasionally get these patients with these craniofacial lesions. So what we'll do is we'll try to take a simplified approach. And the reason why we're going to take a simplified approach is that, you know, this was what I refer to as a nomenclature nightmare. So as I've kind of done my journey, and you guys may experience this too, you know, you're going to come across terms like hemangioma or strawberry hemangioma or capillary lymphangioma, cystic hygroma, veno lymphangioma, nemus flamus, so on and so forth. And I know when I was a re resident and a fellow, and even as a junior faculty, um, it was so confusing to me. And basically, you know, the question that I always ask is, you know, when I see something like this, where in the heck do I even start? So what I wanted to do um, is kind of give you my approach when um, over the last 30 years, as I, I sort of understand, and I'm not saying I'm necessarily an expert at it, but I think I know enough to get me probably through 80 to 85% of, of the cases. So I wanted to kind of go over that. So when we talk about vascular lesions, and I kind of mentioned that nomenclature nightmare before, one of the landmark papers that was published, and this was actually in March of 1982, was by Mulliken and Glowacki. And this, this is from the Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery Group at Boston Children's. And ironically, just a few years later, I actually was a resident there in 1988. So that tells you kind of how old I am. And Mulliken and Glowacki, you know, I think their lab was going. And I actually met some people that worked in their lab. But they came out with this paper. And this really was the first... I think, organized construct on hemangiomas and vascular malformations. So they really tried to make a classification that was based on specific endothelial characteristics. So this was that initial paper. And this really caught a lot of traction. I mean, a lot of us, you know, write papers and a lot of us get into uh, constructs and, and approaches and you try to develop a, um, you know, a classification. It doesn't really have a lot of traction. And this really did have a lot of traction. And so this was the foundation of this society and this classification, which is the vascular anomalies classification. And there is a group, if you really get into craniofacial vascular lesions, there is this international society for the study of vascular anomalies. And in general, the vascular lesions that are associated in the head and neck are classified or approached, I would say, a little bit differently than vascular lesions in the rest of the body, which even makes it more confusing. So when we talk about vascular lesion, then this really is from, this is the basis of Mulliken and Glowacki's work in 1982. They really broke down these lesions into vascular tumors. And the vascular tumors are characterized by endothelial pr proliferation. So when you actually look at the turnover, these are actively turning over lesions. And you can have benign lesions like hemangiomas. You can have sort of these locally aggressive lesions and these include things like Kaposi sarcomas and hemangioepitheliomas. And they do describe this Kaposi sarcoma is actually considered as part of the ISSVA. And this is where it gets a little confusing because if you look at the WHO classification, things like Kaposi sarcoma and even angiosarcomas are actually both in the vascular anomaly classification and they're in the WHO. So it gets a little bit confusing there, but we'll go over all of that, and you'll see how it kind of makes sense. So that is vascular tumors, and you have to have endothelial pr proliferation. But then you also have these vascular malformations. So the vascular malformations are really divided into four types. So one is the lymphatic malformation. Again, we'll go over this in, in gritty detail. Number two are capillary malformations. Number three are arterial malformations. 
And then number four are venous malformations. So these are the four types of vascular malformations. And the key thing about these folks over here on the right side is that there is no endothelial proliferation. Now they can grow, but the endothelium is not proliferating, it's not growing. So there's static lesions, which sort of, if you will, can grow as the body enlarges. So when we begin the discussion of the difference of these vascular lesions, and we're first gonna talk about vascular tumor, the index lesion that we always talk about are hemangiomas. So we'll use hemangiomas as an index lesion, and this will kind of explain to you the whole concept. And then I'll also refer to the ISSVA if you wanna learn more about it. But if you kind of get the stuff that I'm talking about, Again, this is going to get you through 80 to 85 percent of the vascular lesions you'll be seeing in your practice. So the first thing that we talk about, again, hemangiomas are have, sorry about that, hemangiomas actually have, as I mentioned before, this endothelial turnover, and they're divided into infantile and congenital. Now, clinically, this is what you'll see. This is the patient that has a hemangioma. And so for the radiologist in the audience, and also if you're a parent, you see something like this and it gets a little spooky, but this is really, it's a hemangioma. So there are two types. There's an infantile hemangioma. And the thing about infantile hemangiomas is that they are present at birth and then they start to grow and then eventually they involute. Now, there's another type that we'll talk about later, which are congenital hemangiomas. We'll talk about this a little bit later. But specifically, when we talk about infantile hemangiomas, these are diagnosed in the first year of life. They have a rapid growth phase, and then they have an involution phase. Okay. Now, they are, they are identified by specific protein markers. So in order to make the diagnosis of an infantile hemangioma, these have to be GLUT1 positive. I think you're all familiar with GLUT1, but they have to be GLUT1 positive. So you can see the hemangiomas that look like this. This is what they look like histologically. And again, they have to be GLUT1 positive. Now, again, as I mentioned before, they have this rapid growth phase, and then you have this involution phase. Now, they are associated with other lesions. So, you know, if I go to a national meeting and I'm presenting this to my head and neck folks, you know, I'll always show examples of facies, facies syndrome and also some of these asso other associated syndromes, the lumbar association syndrome. But facies is the one that sort of always pops up, especially if you're on some type of panel. And these are associated with posterior, mal posterior fossa malformations, arterial anomalies, cardiovascular anomalies, eye anatomy, so on and so forth. But in general, if you're in a routine practice to see a patient with face syndrome, it's gonna be pretty rare unless you're at a place that is a, a predominantly a, a pediatric hospital. So what we did just now was that we talked about infantile hemangiomas. So this is our infantile hemangiomas. But now we're going to turn our attention to congenital hemangiomas. So congenital hemangiomas, if I could ask you, if you are uh, tuning in, if you could just mute your, um, if you could just mute your, uh, um, Background that'd be great. I'll try to I'll try to mute myself or, or if, uh, that'd be great. Thanks. There's a couple of other. I'm gonna just mute real quick. Thank you. Um, so when we talk about congenital hemangiomas, these hemangiomas are actually present in utero. So you could actually see these if they're large enough when you do an ultrasound. And these hemangiomas are separated from infantile hemangiomas metabolically in the fact that they are GLUT1 negative. So remember, I don't know if they ask you this on your boards in, in ENT, but in our boards, he, uh, infantile hemangiomas are GLUT1 positive, congenital hemangiomas are GLUT1 negative. They're also associated with these other mutations. And to be honest with you, I can never remember mutations. You know, I think if you're at a, a pediatric hospital, you're sort of required to learn every single gene mutation. I think if you're in practice, you know, it's always good to um, review them and be aware that they're associated with mutations in case you want to send them for genetic testing. But in general, it's for me, it's always hard to remember these. Now, when we talk about the congenital hemangiomas, there's actually three different types, if you will, and there may be more, but these are sort of the three types just based purely on the growth pattern. 
So you have this he congenital hemangioma, which is called a, a rich, which is a rapidly involuting congenital hemangioma. So it sort of comes up like this, and then it goes back down. And this is called the rapidly involuting congenital hemangioma. Then you have another one, which is a niche. And this is a non-involuting congenital hemangioma. So you have these lesions that come up like this, and they never go away. And then they just continue to persist. And then if you do biopsy these, they do come back as hemangiomas. And then if you have a fully involuting and a, and a non-involuting, well, then you also have a pitch. You can figure that one out. And that's a partially involuting. So if I had to draw this out, it would probably look something like this. And then maybe it would sort of look something like that. So that is a partially involuting congenital hemangioma. So when we talk about hemangiomas, um, you know, clinically, they, especially if you're a parent, they can be a little freaky. Um, but from our standpoint, from a radiology standpoint, they can be very confusing. So what I'm going to do in, uh, over the next few minutes is really go over in great detail about how we can make the diagnosis of hemangioma based on imaging. So number one, a hemangioma, whether it's congenital or if it's an infantile hemangioma, tends to be lobulated and they tend to be solid. So when I look at this lesion right here, we can see that we have a lobulated lesion and it's also high signal on T2. It's intermediate signal to muscle on T1. Now, when you look at this, I want you guys to all look at this. See these dots right here? See these low areas right here? These are all flow voids. So hemangiomas in the proliferative phase, whether it's infantile or whether it's congenital, because they have that endothelial turnover and they're proliferating, they have to be supplied by something. And that supply is from dilated vessels. And these are the flow voids that you see. And again, I want you to pay attention to this because this is high signal on T2 and it contains the flow voids because we're going to see something else that looks a lot like this. Now, when you give contrast, these hemangiomas tend to uniformly enhance and they avidly enhance, but notice what's not enhanced and the flow voids are not enhancing. And if you do do an ultrasound, you can see prominent vessels on ultrasound. So the characteristics of a hemangioma are it's high signal on T2, low signal on T1, avidly enhanced with contrast, and you can see the flow voids. Now, when you see something like this, and I'm just looking at it purely from an imaging standpoint. The one diagnosis, we know that the most common malignancy to involve the head and neck is a rhabdomyosarcoma. So how do we differentiate this from a rhabdomyosarcoma? Well, rhabdomyosarcomas typically are a little bit lower signal on T2, and they are uh, intermediate signal on T1, and they enhance with contrast, but they tend not to have the flow voids. So if I see a child like this, and I see a lesion like this, and I see multiple flow voids, and I automatically start to think of hemangioma. The other thing, too, is that when you as a surgeon see something like this, you can just palpate it. Because if this big mass right here was a rhabdomyosarcoma, it would be absolutely rock hard. It would be very firm. But if you see something like this, and it's soft and pliable on palpation, and you see these associated imaging findings, then that just reassures you that you're dealing with a benign lesion. And when you see these characteristics, then you're dealing with a hemangioma. So hemangiomas have two phases. There's a proliferative phase. And when you have the proliferative phase, as I mentioned before, they can be lobulated. But you can see these big flow voids within the lesion. And then when you give contrast, these lesions avidly enhance with contrast. So again, those are the classic imaging findings that you'll see in the proliferative phase of a hemangioma. Another example here, again, this is the classical example of a parotid hemangioma. This is actually relatively common when you look in children, because oftentimes these patients will present, you'll see these big masses. But again, you can reassure yourself why high signal on T2, this lesion is avidly enhancing with contrast. We can see the flow voids. And this is a bright blood MRA technique demonstrating the high signal. You can actually see this high signal here involving the vertebral arteries. And this is high signal here involving the arterial flow within the hemangioma. Now, if you have a proliferating phase, then you have an involuting phase. 
So when we talk about hemangiomas, when these things involute, they doesn't necessarily mean they melt away. They oftentimes will have a little bit of residual that's defined histologically by this perivascular adipose tissue and deposition. So this is, if you will, is a burned out chronic hemangioma with just some fibroadipose deposition. From an imaging standpoint, again, it can be a little confusing. So here's a child, same child that had a hemangioma. We can see it involutes, and we still see this sort of residual redness here, and that's that residual hemangioma. Now, from an imaging standpoint, what we end up seeing is that you can still have an enhancing mass, but notice how there are no flow voids within it. So if we see radiologically something that we think is a hemangioma, and we don't see the flow voids, then we can suggest that this hemangioma is in the involuting phase, and it should, you know, depending on whether it's a niche or a pitch, you know, then we don't, can't really predict how much is going to go, but we can say that it's actually involuting. Now, I sort of mentioned this before, I'm really just focusing on the vascular tumors and we're really focusing on hemangiomas. And this is what we just discussed. So this is from the ISSVA. We talked about congenital hemangiomas and there's our rich and there's our niche and there's our pitch. See, I wasn't making this stuff up. But just if you are interested and you are doing TEDS ENT, just realize the ISSVA has these other subdivisions of hemangiomas. Notice how they're hemangiomas, but that's a, like a Mozart sonata. It's the same theme. They're just variations on the theme. So you can have all these other things. And to be honest with you, I'll never be able to diagnose it prospectively. I'll just have to wait for the pathologist to tell me what they are. And then also you can look at these specific gene mutations that are associated, again, which help the pathologist make a specific diagnosis. But I did want to mention this in particular. Notice in the ISSVA classification, Kaposi sarcoma is listed as is angiosarcoma. So just realize that this is both in the ISSVA and it's also in the WHO classification. So it does get a little bit confusing. But in the context of today's talk, we'll just talk, consider these vascular neoplasms. So what we did so far is that we talked about this, vascular tumors, and we talked about hemangioma. So you're probably sick of me saying that, but hopefully you've got it. Now what we're going to do is that we're going to turn our attention to the vascular malformations. As I mentioned before, the vascular malformations are the lymphatics, capillary, arterial, and venous. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through the what I call the Olympic rings approach to vascular malformations. So you have, as I mentioned before, when you look at this, you've got four types. So you can have a capillary malformation. You can have a lymphatic malformation. You can have an arterial malformation. And you can have a venous malformation. So what I want to do in the next portion of the talk is give you the characteristic imaging findings that are associated with each one of these vascular malformations if they arose individually. Notice how these rings right here, the Olympic rings are not crossing. They're completely separate. So the first vascular malformation that I will show you is this, and this is the capillary malformation. So the capillary malformation are pretty much known as birthmarks. And I don't know if you have any of your of this vintage, but when I grew up in the Cold War, this was the most famous capillary malformation. And if you remember, but this is Gorbachev. So Mikhail Gorbachev was, as you know, the, the leader of Russia for, for many years. But this was the sort of the, the capillary malformation that we would see. So they're sort of considered birthmarks, if you will. They, they are a clinical diagnosis. They can be localized or extensive, and this was a child that has a capillary malformation involved in the distribution of V1 and V2, and the other name for this can be a port wine stain. So if you see this capillary malformation along the distribution of V1 and V2, then you have to consider the possibility of Sturge-Weber syndrome. So just remember V1 and V2. And the other thing is that these capillary malformations, and I'm going to come back to this, and these are low flow malformations, and we'll see why that's important in just a little while. In general, we do not need to perform imaging for a capillary malformation. Like I mentioned before, there are various birthmarks. 
And if you want to know about capillary malformation, again, I, I refer you to the ISSVA. This will tell you all the various gene mutations that are associated with this, and there's quite a few. But from our standpoint, we don't need to image this as a radiology. This just happens to be a capillary malformation that we did image, but it does make a couple of important points. Now, this is a contrast-enhanced T1-weighted image with fat suppression. So this is located, obviously, through the floor of the mouth. So there's our mandible. This is the genioglossus geniohyoid muscle. Here's the, uh, um, the uh, sublingual gland. Here is the hyoglossus muscle. Here's the mylohyoid muscle. So we're in the floor of the mouth, and we gave contrast. But notice how the yellow arrows point at these linear areas of enhancement. So capillary malformations, as we do see in the port wine stain, can have a little bit of flow within it. And oftentimes, these flow is very little, but it tends to be an interstitial. It tends to be very, very linear. So it's important to remember this because when we start to combine the vascular malformations, you can see how we can come up with a specific diagnosis if we're familiar with this characteristic appearance. So for capillary malformations, we don't have a lot of mass effect. They can have increased T2 signal, and we tend to see this linear enhancement. Now, the second one of the Olympic rings is the lymphatic malformation. So the lymphatic malformation actually has, again, many names to it. So occasionally we'll start here, this referred to as a cystic hygroma. You know, I've heard this referred to as a lymphangioma. In general, the terminology, excuse me, that we should be using is lymphatic malformation. These are typically seen in younger children, but oftentimes, you know, we'll see them in adults. And, you know, they're just never diagnosed, and we just happen to pick them up incidentally. 75% arise in the head and neck area. It is, again, associated with this mutation, P1K3CA. It's associated occasionally with uh, skin vesicles. So on rare occasion, I think this sort of shows it here. Occasionally, you can they have these little vesicles on the skin. And it is classified as microcystic, macrocystic, and mixed. And again, when I was a resident, that's the only thing I remembered about lymphatic malformations. I remember it was microcystic, macrocystic, and mixed. But when we look at the imaging findings, this basically just looks like a bag of water. So this is a T2-weighted image. And I think you all can see this. It's just basically high signal on T2 and their low signal on T1. What they do not contain is that there is no enhancement within the, the classic lymphatic malformation. So this is still considered a low flow vascular malformation. Now, again, why that's important is based on treatment. So this is an, oh, sorry about, this is an example again of a lymphatic malformation. So here we have the cystic lesion right here that's involving the submandibular space. This is just the submandibular gland that's been encompassed by the lymphatic malformation. This is it on T2 weighted images. We can see it's high signal. If you look real closely, there's some cetacean. So you can you know, postulate that this is macrocystic. And when we give contrast, there's really no enhancement. This enhancement right here is just that submandibular gland that we talked about. And maybe there's a little bit of enhancement from some adjacent vessels. But lymphatic malformations, just the classic ones, do not enhance at all. So again, they just kind of look like a bag of water. The other thing about lymphatic malformations is that they can extend into multiple spaces. So in this case, it's involving the submandibular space. But notice how it kind of creeps and crawls along the submandibular gland. So they can, the term that we tend to use in radiology is that they're transpatial. So if you see a child or, or a young adult that has this, you know, water bag appearance and it's kind of infiltrating to different areas, well, consider the possibility of a lymphatic malformation. Well, as I mentioned before, lymphatic malformations are low flow malformations, and it's debatable whether you can treat these. Now, if something is well defined, then surgically you can go in and resect it. The challenges with lymphatic malformations, they can involve multiple areas. So look at this lymphatic malformation, classic malformation, high T2 signal, but notice how it's deep to the sternocleidomastoid muscle, then it extends anteriorly along the carotid space. And lo and behold, right here, it actually abuts the lateral pharyngeal wall. 
So when you have this type of extension, it can be hard to get a full resection. So one of the options would be is that we can treat these through radiology with interventional radiology. And the decision that we make is really based on whether or not it's high flow or low flow. So because this is a low flow malformation, there are not a lot of big arteries and a lot of big veins, then these are typically treated with some type of sclerotherapy or percutaneous drainage. So under fluoroscopy, you can see the needles right here. You take your sclerosing agent, you mix it up with contrast, and then you inject it. And this way we can see where this is going. And again, it's important that this is low flow because if you injected the sclerosing agent and it was in a big artery, then all of a sudden that's gonna be taken throughout the body and you could really in, uh, cause a lot of damage. So that's why from an imaging standpoint, we need to confirm the diagnosis and then assure our interventionalists that there's no flow voids. And therefore, that's why we focus on the low flow malformation. So the next Olympic ring that we'll talk about is the venous malformation. Now, surprisingly enough, and I, I, I was kind of surprised by this as well too, this is the most common systemic vascular malformation. And it's associated with abnormal veins. Now, clinically, if you see a patient that has a, a, a venous malformation, what has been reported is this bluish skin right here. So remember, lymphatic malformations, you couldn't really see much, maybe of some vesicles. For hemangiomas, we saw that big strawberry lesion coming out of the skin. But in this case, these are the bluish lesions that are characteristic of a venous malformation. So if we see this, what are the imaging findings that are telling us that we're dealing with a classic venous malformation? And again, this gets really confusing because, you know, I'll go to my meetings, and I'll read the textbooks, and I still see the terminology get a little confused. But for me, and what's been reported is that the classic venous malformation has to be intramuscular and it contains flea bullets. Now you can have venous malformations that contain flea bullets and not be intramuscular, or you can have venous malformations that can be muscular, intramuscular and not contain flea bullets. But for us as a radiologist to be really, really comfortable with the diagnosis, what I look for is that I look for a lesion that's involving the muscle. You can see that the, in this case, the temporalis muscle is expanded and we can see these flea bullets. If I see that, and especially when you palpate it, it's a soft pliable mass, then I have a high likelihood that what we're dealing with is actually a venous malformation. Here's another example. This is a T2 weighted image. And when we look at this muscle right here, what muscle is this? Well, this is the masseter muscle. So this mass right here is involving the masseter muscle. Notice how it's high T2 signal. And if you look real closely, there's a little black dot right there. And that black dot right there is a flebolith. So when I look at this and I see this uh, intramuscular mass and I see there's a flebolith, then I am pretty comfortable that this is a venous malformation. So as I mentioned before, if you want to know more, go to the ISSVA. They're subdivided meat, venous malformation into all of these. And again, they identify the specific mutations that are associated with it. I won't even get into that. But on the other hand, here's another example of a venous malformation. So this is a venous malformation that involved the masseter muscle. If you look real closely, we can see the high T2 signal. This represents blood products and probably clot in the malformation. And you can see that it's actually extending into the parotid gland. And on this T1 weighted images, we can see this lesion completely isolated to the muscle. So again, that suggests a diagnosis of venous malformation. Now, what has been associated with venous malformation is delayed enhancement. So if you do orbital imaging, you know, we learned, and I learned many years ago, that the most common retrobulbar mass in, in a child or even an adult was a cavernous malformation of the orbit. We don't use the term cavernous malformation anymore because we now use the term venous malformation. And because these venous malformation are basically pockets of pooling blood, they are vascular, but they're low flow and the enhancement pattern tends to be delayed. 
So this is a gradient echo sequence pre-contrast. And then when I start to give the contrast, what you can see here is this cooling enhancement right here. And lo and behold, what muscle is it in? It's actually within the masseter muscle. So if I see something like this and you do do some type of gradient echo or dynamic sequences, which I really do find helpful in these cases, you can again confirm the diagnosis of a venous malformation. Venous malformations, as I mentioned before, are low flow. There's no big arteries and no big fat draining veins. We'll get to those in the next Olympic ring. But as a result, when you have a malformation such as this, notice this thing is isolated here to the masseter muscle. If you choose to treat this, you can either take it out from surgery or you can, again, treat this with sclerotherapy. And again, this is achievable because you know that the sclerotherapy agent is going to be localized to the lesion because there are no big flow voids. So again, from a radiology standpoint, that's why it's important to be familiar with the appearance and also specifically mention that there are no flow voids. So the next Olympic ring that we'll talk about is the classic arterial malformation. Now, I specifically say arterial malformation for a reason. And that is a true arterial malformation when we talk about vascular malformation is actually an arteriovenous fistula. So it's not an arteriovenous malformation, but it's actually an arteriovenous fistula. So these are pretty rare to see in the head and neck. This is one unusual case of a patient that presented with pulsatile tinnitus, one of the really crazy cases that I see quite often, actually. And what we see here this dilatation right here of the retromandibular vein. And we also see enlargement right here of the internal maxillary artery. So this is why the patient presented with right-sided pulsatile tinnitus. And then when we do our coronal imaging, we can see enlargement here of the common carotid artery. These are all big branches of the external carotid artery. Right here is the retromandibular vein. And this retromandibular vein drains into the external jugular vein. So you sort of see this and you're thinking like, wow, was this an arteriovenous malformation? Well, they did an angiogram on this and they actually found this specific direct fistula. So again, AV fistulas in the head and neck are rare, but this is the fourth type of a Olympic ring when we talk about vascular malformations involving the head and neck. Now, if you're a neuroradiologist like myself, the classic AV fistula that we will end up seeing is the carotid cavernous fistula. So this is a direct communication between the artery and the vein. And typically they're seen post-traumatically. Occasionally they can be congenital. And this is felt to be due to a defect in the intracavernous portion of the carotid artery where there's a direct communication with the cavernous sinus, the main primary venous drainage system. And then what you end up doing is getting arterialization right here of the superior ophthalmic vein. So again, if you're interested, you can learn more about AV fistulas. You know, I'll refer you to the ISSVA, and you can learn all about them in greater detail. Another example here, this was an example of an arteriovenous fistula. What we see here is a C, C fistula. In this case, we see multiple large veins here involving the cavernous sinus. We see big dilatation right here of the superior ophthalmic vein. And here on the sagittal reconstructed image, this is one of the largest superior ophthalmic veins that you'll ever see. This is a, a CT angio. We're looking at it in the lateral plane. These are the intracranial vascular. Sure, this is the cavernous sinus. And this right here corresponds to this big dilated superior ophthalmic vein. So again, another example here of a AV fistula, which in this case is a carotid cavernous fistula, and the cavernous portion represents the venous side of that fistula. So what we've done so far is that we talked about the vascular malformations. And so what we did, and I'll go through this because I want you guys to learn it, is that capillary, how do you remember capillary? Well, this was the birthmark, right? So remember Gorbachev or you remember Sturge Weber, this was like the birthmark. So I'll just put a B right here. The lymphatic was what? Basically, this was just a bag of fluid. So we maybe I'll just put water balloon here. So I don't know if you ever remember you were a kid, you threw water balloons at your, your siblings or your parents and then run away, right? Or your friends. So we'll put a water balloon right there. Then we have the venous side. 
And the venous side was typically, it was intramuscular and it contained flebolates. So I'll just put a PHLB. And the arterial we just talked about, and basically this was the arterial venous fistula, okay? So I think we can all pretty much conceptualize this, right? These are non-endothelial proliferating lesions. They can grow as you, as you, as you get bigger because things, if you will, I just kind of think of them as stretching. So that's why they can present later in life. But these are the individual characteristics. But what makes this whole thing confusing? It makes it confusing because the majority of times they don't occur in isolation. What ends up happening is that they can occur together. So if you have something that looks like this and you have a combination of arterial and venous, now you have the classic arterial venous malformation. So when you have an arterial venous malformation, what does this end up looking like? Well, what you see in the AV malformation is something that looks like this. So this was a patient that presents with a bleeding epistaxis, or I shouldn't say epistaxis, bleeding from the floor of the mouth. And when you look at this, what you see here are multiple dilated flow voids, huge flow voids that represent arteries and veins and involve the floor of the mouth. Now, the question that you have to ask yourself is that, yeah, Suresh, you know, I can see these big arteries and veins, but you know what? They're also big vascular tumors that can have this as well, too. How do I know it's not a big vascular tumor? Well, the way that what you know it's not a vascular tumor is that, first of all, if you have a vascular tumor, you know, you should have some bulk associated with it. So remember when we talked about hemangiomas? You had flow voids, but you had endothelial proliferation, so the thing would actually grow. In this case, what we see are these big, big dilated flow voids, but instead of seeing a big soft tissue mass, you're actually seeing atrophy involving the muscles of the floor of the mouth. And the reason that happens, and this is one of the things that can help you to prevent confusion, is that what is an arterial venous malformation missing? It's missing capillaries. So you have artery, then you have capillaries, and then you have veins. So what's the real function of a capillary? The capillary is to take the nutrients that the artery is delivering and then have them disseminate these into the tissues. And then that's how the tissues can grow by getting the nutrients. Because in an AV malformation, there's no capillaries, there's direct communications through this nidus. Therefore, the tissue is not getting enough nutrients and therefore the soft tissue actually shrinks. So that's why you actually have atrophy. So if I see something like this and I get a little confused, I start looking at the surrounding tissue. And if I don't see a big soft tissue mass, then I'm actually pretty convinced that we're dealing with this. And this is the angiogram from the same patient demonstrating dilated arteries, and we can see the early venous drainage right here. Notice how we're still in the arterial vase, but we can actually see the drainage, and this is the big nidus right here in the arterial venous malformation. Um, so another example here, this was a preembolization and postembolization. Here we can see that this AVM was completely embolized. So what we just talked about was arterial and venous malformation. So what's another thing that can happen? Well, what if you ended up having a lymphatic and the venous malformation combined? Well, this gives you a lymphatic venous or a venolymphatic malformation. Now, on the surface right here, it's got a lot of syllables. So you can be confused. But remember what it took for us to identify a pure lymphatic malformation or a pure venous malformation. Remember the lymphatic malformation was what? It was a water bag, right? And the venous malformation were flebolates and it was actually intramuscular. So when you're faced with something that looks confusing like this, what I end up doing is this. First of all, I want to know whether it's soft or whether or not it's enlarging. If it's a soft lesion that's pliable, then that kind of makes me feel better. I'm dealing with probably a vascular malformation. But notice how this lesion right here is arising from the masseter muscle. And so on the T2-weighted images, we can see it's really bright. So if it's really, really bright right here, that tells me it likely has a lymphatic component. 
The fact that there's an intramuscular component, well, that goes along with the venous malformation. And then if you look real closely right here, we can see these black dots. Now, these black dots can represent flea bullets. And again, that goes along with the venous malformation. And then when we give contrast, we can see it's not robustly enhancing. If this was really, really enhancing a lot, then you know I'd be a little bit more worried. But the fact that this has high T2 signal located in the muscle, has these flea bullets, and it's soft on palpation, well, then I feel real comfortable that this is a lymphatic venous malformation. This is another example. This was actually the, the husband of one of our techs. So, so you know, they've just been married, and, and the, the tech comes up to me and said, you know, Dr. McCurgy, my husband's got this big bluish thing on his face, and sometimes it gets bigger, and sometimes it doesn't. And they haven't been able to figure out what it is. I said, all right, you know, let's do an MR on this. So when we brought him in, we can see that we have this mass right here, right? It's high signal on T2-weighted images. Then when we give contrast, we don't really see a lot of enhancement. So we know it's not enhancing a lot. The reason, reason why this is brighter compared to this is that we did this with fat suppression. So that's why you have a little, you know, a spurious increased signal. Then you can see this mass is actually involving multiple spaces. We can see that it's involving the buccinator muscle. And lo and behold, the yellow arrow is again pointing to a bunch of flea bullets. So high T2 signal makes me think lymphatic. The involvement of the muscle makes me think venous. And then when I see the flea bullet right there, then I think that it's venous. So we made the diagnosis of lymphatic venous malformation. So he did end up going to a special clinic, but they opted not to do anything because, well, you know, he didn't want to have surgery. And then he also didn't under want to go sclerotherapy just because, you know, he just decided to kind of to kind of live with what he has. Again, it's important to identify these properly as low flow malformations. Notice in these cases, there's no bleak flow void. So as a result, you can uh, treat these with some type of sclerosing agent if you would if you would like to do that. What, what if we have a situation like this where we have capillary and lymphatic? So now we have a lymphocapillary or capillary lymphatic malformation. So think about it, right? So think about, remember, what characterized capillary malformations? Well, this was the birthmarks. This is when we had a little bit of linear enhancement, not a lot. And lymphatics, we just went over, right? It was just a big bag of water. So when you see something like this, you're like, hmm, you know, what is this thing right now? Well, you look at it, and number one, where is it located at? So the first thing that I do is I draw a line down the middle. Well, actually, the first thing I do is take my pulse, because in a kid, you always get a little bit worried, and you see something that looks like this, you start to say, what the heck is this? So I always have to take my pulse, right? The second thing that I have to do is identify where it's arising from. So I draw a line down the middle, and I compare the right side to the left side. So here's the normal parotid gland here, and then there's a retromandibular vein. And lo and behold, this lesion, whatever it's going to be, is completely involved in the parotid gland. So the next thing I do is, all right, I got a mass involved in the parotid gland. Now, it doesn't look super solid, right? Because it's on T2, it's very bright. And then when we give contrast, we can see just a little bit of linear enhancement here. So now I'm thinking, you know what? This looks like its lymphatic component to it. And then when I give contrast, I can see this linear enhancement to it. It's not really involving the muscle. I don't see any flea bullets. So that kind of takes away the um, venous component. I don't see big flow voids because if I saw big flow voids and I would think about arterial. And the other thing too, is that because I don't see a big soft tissue mass associated with the flow voids, remember hemangiomas, remember that parotid hemangioma I showed that was had a big soft tissue mass, it enhanced with contrast and it also had multiple flow voids. I don't see that here either. So when I think about it and I kind of dissect it and I know exactly what the components individually are, these linear areas of enhancement go with capillary, the high T2 signal here goes with lymphatic. I don't see big flow voids in it, so I know it's low flow, and I can make the diagnosis of a capillary lymphatic or a lymphocapillary malformation. Now, the interesting thing for me is, is that 
I remember back when I was uh, at University of Michigan and I would really sort of comb the path reports, it was amazing how many times I would read out one of these vascular malformations and then the pathologist would basically say, yes, this was whatever I said it was. And I don't think I'm that good. So I, one day I asked the pathologist and I said, you know, you know, I see a lot of similarities between the imaging and what you say on pathology. And they kind of came back to me and said, well, that's because, you know, we really rely on you all to make the diagnosis. Um, because in general, this classification system is not necessarily taught to all trained pathologists. So that's why when we talk about these specialty things like vascular malformations in the head and neck, you know, from an imaging standpoint, we really play such a big difference. Another example here, this was a transpatial lesion, so it's involving multiple areas. We can see the fluid collections. We can see these linear enhancement right here. So again, we can make the diagnosis of a capillary lymphatic or a lymphocapillary malformation. So just to end the lecture, what we've done so far, just to take you through it, is that we talked about hemangiomas then we talked about the individual characteristics of these. And remember, this was the birthmark, this was the water balloon, this was the muscle and the flea bolith, and this was the big flow voids. And we talked about combining two of these. So we went this way, we went this way, I think we went uh, this way. So you know, we went different ways to combine two. But again, oftentimes, what if you have three or even worse, what if you have four? And if you have three or four, then we refer to this as a mixed vascular malformation. But again, we can take it one step further because if you see something like this, I mean, look how complicated this is. This patient has a huge vascular malformation involving the oral cavity, right, and also the skin. But what I have to do when I see something like this is, again, take a deep breath. So first of all, when I look at something like this, the questions that go through my mind are, you know, number one, does the patient have neurofibromatosis? No, there's no neurofibromatosis. It's soft and pliable. And so once I get that information out and I don't, they have, they don't have an underlying phacomatosis or they don't have a big, a big tumor that you know about. Well, I look at this, this is the T2 weighted sequence. And I see a lot of high signal here on the T2 weighted sequences. Then I also see it's involving multiple spaces. So this tells me that there has to be a lymphatic component to it. Now I look at the T1 weighted images, and then when I give contrast, I see a lot of contrast enhancement here. And some of it is, is linear as well, too. So I know there has to be a capillary component to this. And then if I do a CT scan, lo and behold, I see lots of flebolites right here. And notice how it's involving multiple muscles. It's pretty obvious here it's involving the muscles. And now I have my flebolites. So then I've got my lymphatic, I've got my capillary, I've got my venous. And so this is why we would call this a mixed vascular malformation. But that's why knowing these individual components of the vascular malformations allow us to make these pretty complicated diagnoses. Another example here, this is something involving the orbit. So we can say, well, hold on for a second. Is this a cavernous malformation or a venous malformation? Well, not completely. Notice how on the T2-weighted images, we can see the high T2 signal, so it's lymphatic. When we give contrast, we can see that there's linear enhancement right here. So when we see something like this, again, we can make the diagnosis of that mixed vascular malformation. And when we see something like this, because if in this particular case, if you have capillary venal lymphatic, again, despite all of this, this is a very low flow lesion. And again, they can be treated with sclerotherapy. So, you know, when we started this uh, lecture, you know, we talked about the nomenclature nightmare. And so I asked this question and I asked this myself numerous times is where do I even start? when I'm looking at these vascular malformations. And I don't know if you remember Charlie Brown or not. And my kids don't even like Charlie Brown, which makes me sad because I love Charlie Brown. But I guess if you like the symptoms, the Simpsons, I guess you can like the symptoms. But it's frustrating saying, where do I even start? So the last slide that I would leave you this is this, is that realize that vascular lesions are divided into vascular tumors. And they're specifically vascular tumors because of endothelial proliferation. And the index case that you'll end up seeing for the majority of these in your practice is going to be hemangiomas. 
And remember, there were congenital and infantile. We went over those uh, types. And then finally, we talked about the vascular malformations, and we talked about the Olympic rings. So what I would ask for you in this case is just remember the classical appearance for capillary, classic appearance for lymphatic, classic appearance for arterial and venous. And if you do that, then you can combine the Olympic rings. And I think this will pro uh, provide you a pretty good infrastructure to better understand these really fascinating, very compl complex cases, but also kind of demystify the confusion that comes with making the diagnosis. And once you make the diagnosis, whether or not it's high flow or low flow, you will absolutely be able to direct how these patients are treated. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. That was a, a great lecture. I know from uh, an ENT kind of resident board perspective, I know it gets the hardest part for us always tends to be uh, differentiating the um, infantile versus uh, congenital in terms of being GLUT1 positive. That tends to be the big thing they like to ask us questions on specifically. So that was really nice for that. Let's see if my video worked. <clears throat> we got a couple of minutes. Any questions at all from you guys? Oh, um, if not, um, someone's got a question there. Yeah. Mary? Yes. Hello, Professor. Happy New Year. Hey, Happy New Year to you. Oh, thank you so much. I really enjoyed the session. It was wonderful as, as usual. Uh, I have a question uh, regarding uh, the imaging. Uh, well, you uh, mentioned that hemangiomas are like endothelial proliferations, but uh, like the cavernous uh, ones, uh, they don't have like any uh, bulk of mass. Uh, but in the imaging, they look like pretty similar, uh, the venous malformations and the hemangiomas, because like the hemangiomas mm. have the fluoids, uh, uh, but uh, on the other hand, like the venous malformations,